If you are familiar with car audio, you have likely heard of the legendary brand JL Audio, a company that literally laid the foundation for high quality, high performance aftermarket car audio is also a huge part of the marine and home audio world. Now, if you guys have watched my videos before, you know that I've been a longtime fan of JL Audio using their gear in several of the builds. That's why when I got the opportunity to come down here and visit their Miramar, Florida location, I knew that I had to go. So what all happens here at the Miramar location, let's head on over and find out. So I'm here with Mr. Steve Teresi, VP of Technical Services for JL Audio. Yes. And before we get started, I mean, we have a ton to see today. We do. It's gonna be quite the video. But before we get started, just a little bit of you know company history. Uh, how, how long has JL Audio been around? Company started in 1975, so kind of old. So <laughs> yeah, 1975. Wow. And how long at this location? Uh, since the late 90s. You know, it's kind of amorphous about when that all started, but yeah, the late 90s. Wow. And how how big? At this point, we're about 340,000 square feet. Jeez. So it's not tiny. I hope you got your walking shoes on. So. Yeah, I've, I have a feeling we're going to be doing a lot of walking today. I mean, we, we already kind of saw down the parking lot how mm -hmm. big it is. This is a big operation. And you're going to see it all. You ready to head on over? Let's do it. Awesome. All right, so we are in the first area that we're going to take a look at here. Correct. Tell me a little bit about this. Well, this is our uh, main speaker manufacturing area. We have several different production lines. We're going to walk you through and show you everything that we possibly can. So our small driver line is uh, currently focused on building a lot of our marine products. So our 6.5 and, and our 7.7, .7, and I think our 880 would be on our medium driver line, as well as a 10-inch driver, and occasionally they'll sneak the, uh, the big monster, the 12-inch uh, uh, Marine sub on that one wow, as well. Okay. So. Where we're standing right yep. now, we have the thin woofer line. So I'm guessing TW3. Uh, TW1 and TW3 can be built on this line. Yep. Which we've used a lot of on the channel. Yes. So. All right, so right now we're going to start with looking at, it looks like they're doing the C7 production. They are. On the small driver line here. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and right now they're doing the six and a half? The six and a half inch C7 driver, that's oh. right. So uh, the first station here is when they start prepping the materials. Uh, they'll get the frames and they'll start marrying the parts together at this, this first stage. And then we have processes that go all the way down the line, each stage of the game. You'll also notice that the area that she's working on, that's where we charge the motors. So the magnets come to us, we assemble the motors. Uh, the motors being the back plate, top plate, and magnet itself and it will charge it in the magnetizer. Yeah. As it comes on down the line, you'll see them, uh, you'll see there's various different fixtures that'll hold the product in two orientations. One's face down, the other one's face up so they can do whatever operations they need to. So this is where they'll start uh, working with the spider and the lead wire assemblies and then they'll marry it up with the cones. I'm very delicate with these because they get mad at me. So, <laughs> um, but these are little separators to keep them from getting all scratched up. So. Wow. And it looks like, so let's count real quick. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight people working on this line. Nine, one in the room. Not, so, oh, and yeah. then the room in the back there. We'll, yes. we'll get to that, but I'm guessing that's like a final That's our final ins inspection, inspection where we check everything. Yep, 100% okay. inspection. Yeah, so let's uh, let's continue down sure. the line here. Down. So what they're working on here, you can actually see we have uh, instructions at each one of the workstations. You'll notice that there's a fixture that she's using to help guide her as she puts the adhesive on. But you'll see that she's got a special machine that, um, you know, she can rotate that around to make sure she's dispensing the right amount of, of adhesive. All the soft parts are starting to come together now, and you'll notice that the frame here, that this tape covering the, the gap area that's where the voice coil is going to sit, you don't want to have any debris fall in there because it'll show up as a rubbing. It, 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 I just wanted to bring up, too, we were talking about this a little bit off camera, so all the fixtures, all, all the aluminum that's holding everything, that's all built here in-house. Right in our machine shop, 100%. Yeah, yeah. all the automation so. steps, all, all the pneumatics and controls, all you guys it. do all that. All so. done here by our team. Here they're actually prepping the cones. Um, so uh, adhesives like to, to have a nice bite on a material. If it's a really smooth, shiny material, it's really hard for the adhesive to get a bond on it. So what, what they're literally doing is roughing it up to make sure that that adhesive has a better surface to attack itself to. Okay. So. So here she's actually doing the soldering of the lead wires. Oh wow, it's so cool to see the, these speakers all coming together. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> so we started over there with a bunch of parts and we're only, what, 20 feet down here yep. and we've got finished, finished speakers. Pretty darn close to it. So <laughs> she just dropped the cone into the, the fixture there where the motor was already uh, uh, positioned. So she's got everything all set. She's now treating the dust cap. The automation is rotating the speaker at a constant speed. Why, why is it rotating? Oh, to apply the adhesive. So now she's going to lay down the adhesive line for the dust cap. 
Now, so obviously we're, we're building the six and a half inch right now. Are the three and a half inch also? That's open? actually a different area. That's um, okay. what we call a cell manufacturing area where there's a single operator that has all the, the necessary parts right in front of them. Okay. And it's a little carousel. I'll show it to you in just a few minutes. Awesome. Look, and it looks like this is where uh, they also put on the... Yeah, the, the final the accoutrement, all the stuff that makes it look the way um, our customers are used to seeing it. So. Awesome. So as I guess this part um, here is the last stage before it goes into our test chamber. Yeah. Want to take a look? Yeah. Hey. Hello, how are you? <laughs> this is Mark. <laughs> nice, to, nice to meet you. <laughs> Testing all those beautiful speakers. Yeah. <laughs> so what will happen is as the product comes in, she'll remove it from the, the line and she'll drop it into the fixture after inspecting the product. She has a scanner to scan the serial numbers that I mentioned before. So she'll do that, she'll call it up in the system, and then she'll perform a test. And she's got it connected um, to the, the audio amplifier. And to, for the sanity of hearing, she has it down firing into a chamber that has some treatment in it. And she runs sweeps, and she's got error bars. You know, pass fail, right? So if it crosses the line, it'll fail. What's interesting is, so with this being the C7 product, this is unique where you can go and look up online Correct. and see the actual yep. measurements. You'll be able to see the actual measurement, right? And so that's where this all goes down. 100 percent. Yep. That's cool. Yep. Another thing she'll do is she'll test the product itself. Obviously, the specifications are important, but she'll listen and she'll look at it as it moves to see if she hears any issues. She could sometimes pick up a ticking or a noise from the speaker that maybe wouldn't show up on a suite. Gotcha. All right, so now we're on the other side of the wall. The other side of the wall, this is where um, finished inspected product will get uh, scanned into the system finally, packaged up, and then palletized and brought over to our finished goods area. Awesome. Ready, ready to go out the door. Ready to go. We're literally right out that door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very cool. Let's, let's head on to the, to the next. Let's go on to the next section. All right, so now we are at the thin line cell. Yes, we call this the thin line. This is um, the 13TW5, um, the, both for the home and the mobile audio version is made right here. This is where I think it all starts. So this inner structure that we have here, um, it's, it's actually part of the patent that we received on this product. It's called concentric tube. Without getting too technical, it's a way that we can actually compress the speaker and by, um, by putting most of the guts up inside the speaker. And this is the, the patent um, that we had on this. And this little runner system here is actually, a, I think it's an important part of the JL Audio story. This product was designed many, many, many years ago at a time where um, injection molding was not quite as advanced as it is now. So obviously it's an injection molded part. You can see some of the intricacies of where the lead wires all go and how it's all set up. But this inner structure here is going to be removed. When we designed this part, we sent it out to an injection molding company to make the part. And they looked at the complexity of it and said, we can't make that part. Huh. So we sent it to the next injection molding company, and they said, we can't make that part. So a you know, logical engineer would say, OK, we need to redesign the part. It's not what we did. <laughs> we designed the mold to make oh, the wow. part to make the speaker that we designed. So wow. we developed this runner system that allows an injection mold to get to all these detail points without having to do secondary processes. And, and these so, runners stay in the final product? This is actually going to be removed. Oh, all this removed. is simply to pump the material in to get the part that oh, we want. Oh, okay. And I think real quick, we should probably explain for the people at home that might not know the, the TW5. So this is literally a 13 and a half inch subwoofer driver. Yeah, it's so, only about two and a half inches deep. And it's only two and a half <laughs> inches deep. So, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah, like so. the amount of engineering and design that went into having that shot of a mountain depth, right. but still having that massive of a, of a cone surface area. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, the output is insane, but perfect for like under seat truck applications, 100%. anywhere that you have real small amount of airspace. And that, that's our thing too. They can actually work in a very small yeah, amount about of About 0.7 cubic feet, if my memory serves wow. right, which is really tiny. For a 13 and a half inch woofer, it's, it's pretty compact. Yeah. It's all about no compromise. And instead of like just taking a normal speaker and just squishing it down and compromising, mm -hmm. we develop from the inside out. The patent that we have on the concentric tube allows us to get full-size speaker performance in a very shallow package. So um, again, with adhesives, adhesives are what hold everything together, literally, right? So she's prepping this, um, this part to let the adhesives bond onto it. So what she's done here, she's taken the, um, the concentric tube part, and she's dropped it into the frame, and she's getting it prepped up. She's routing the lead wires into the, the holes that are part of the uh, engineered part. Now you'll see that she's got her hands clear. She's waiting for our other operator. She's going to get her hands clear, and our carousel will do its magic. There we go. There we go. So the carousel will move to the next part. So this cell type manufacturing allows a small number of operators to do a large number of tasks on a given product. So they'll rotate literally back and forth. Um, the, the sides that are not being actively worked on, that's okay. It's dry time for the adhesives. You know, oh, adhesives okay. needs time to set. So you get to see Epson work here. 
Oh, so, okay, so the station between these two operators is a robot exactly. controlled station exactly. and it's applying an adhesive now mm -hmm. to, so that's going to be the adhesive for? That one is going to be for the spider, Okay. Um, but there's another one that's going to be for the voice coil and another one that's going to be for the cone. The one for the voice coil is, um, what's the word, it's, it's a pain in the neck, that's what the <laughs> word is. And the reason for that is the, the, the wall of the voice coil is incredibly thin. Oh wow. Right? So back in the day when we first started making them, our team would have to put a bead of adhesive right on that edge. Whew. And it's real easy to shake, right? So right. if you shake, the adhesive goes on the voice coil and you don't have a speaker anymore, right? So you can't do that. And of course, in the early days, that was really scary. We didn't want to ruin anything, right? So we hired Epson. He was actually <laughs> one of the first robots that we put on our production line. And he could do that perfectly every single time. We don't lose people, we gain people. And by automations, we don't replace, we augment. So once they're done with the part here, they'll stage it in this area. And again, we have a clamping mechanism that holds equal pressure on it. And you'll see on the inside here, it's like a speaker, but it's missing something. The motor. Yeah. So the motor actually gets secured into the speaker. Very different from the other production that we do where the motor is attached to the frame when we build everything into it. This, we build everything and then put the motor in. Interesting. So it's, it's kind of neat. So as this um, is drying, it'll stage here, and then we'll put the dust cap on, and then ultimately we'll put the, the motor in, secure it, and then goes into our chamber for final testing. Right, so this is a neat little room here. This is, uh, <laughs> this is where we do the final testing of every TW5 that we make. So first thing that the operator will do, they'll connect it to a, a, um, an amplifier as a tone generator. They'll scan the product into the system, and they'll go through a series of tests. They'll move the speaker around and make sure there's no vibration or rocking mechanisms, and they'll take a measured frequency response and make sure it's 100% every single time. If it is, it's approved, goes over into our shipping area, and out to you guys. And, and again, like, so I see enter serial numbers, so everything's mm -hmm. probably tracked right 100%. to the serial number. Yeah. Do you guys keep records of all those tests? Every right? single one of them, awesome. 100%. And a lot of it goes back into engineering to see uh, tolerance variations so that we can either get another vendor or whatever we need to do to make sure we're always at the top of the game. So I wanted to show you QA. Um, obviously, we care a lot about the finish goods, but the, before you can have a finished good, you need good parts. So in this room here is where we'll take anything that is received by the company, all the different parts that we use to build all the speakers, and you'll see that we have documentation for every product that we build here. This isn't even all of them. This is just a good majority of them. We have some golden samples that we'll have for references. We have the measurement platform here where we have all the calipers and all the measurement tools to make sure everything's right. Uh, but the, for me, the crown jewel is the new guy over here. So this is a, a digitizing wand that basically can inspect a part and it has a reach of over nine feet, so we can actually inspect very, very large parts and compare it to like a 3D modeling software that we may have spec'd a part in, so we can literally get pixel perfect uh, dimensions on each one of these things. Wow. Um, they've actually scanned people's arms and you can see the hairs on their arms using <laughs> the scanner. So that's the kind of detail that we're looking for to make sure that the, the not only the dimensions, but the fit and finish of everything is always as, as top notch as it possibly can be. Awesome. So I think this is a, an area that's often overlooked, but for us, quality starts in this room. So. And so this is all in Coming parts. Right. Everything that comes into the building before it goes over into production will come through here. Usually as a lot sample. We'll do like a 5% sample of a given batch of parts that we pick at random. These t the team here will measure everything against the references, and if it passes 100%, then the lot is assumed, and then we do what I call line-level inspection. So if an operator is looking at a part doesn't look right, they'll set it aside and go on to the next one. So you have inspections several... several Throughout the whole process, yeah. Right. And it all starts, again, like in this room here, so everything. I learned recently that um, they have tools that can actually measure the shininess of like some of the chrome parts or mm. you know the dullness and all of these have parameters I don't know what they are but they do and that's what matters most that they have all the documentation of what it's supposed to be and they measure against that so right it's so really it's, not, cool. it's not always just tolerances it's also surface hundred percent yep. yeah it's cool. And, it's, uh, and, and you got to appreciate, too, the, the sound system. Oh, gotta, yeah, you got to have music. You know, it's an audio company. we got to have audio going, right? So. We'll, we'll get a shot of that for sure for the guys at home. Yep. I'm trying to remember. Uh, 2001. Right. <laughs> and that's a 15W3 that we were making at the time. That was the first production stuff that we made. Wow. All right, so Steve, so obviously we've been taking a look at the manufacturing areas right. so far, and we were just walking through here to transition to our next spot, and I had to stop us because <laughs> just the sheer scale yeah, it's kind of, big. <laughs> of this building. So so literally all the way at that blue curtain on yeah, the other all end, the way down there. That's uh, production the, all the way to here. All the way to here. And then what do we have here? Here's uh, parts for production. So a lot of the materials that we use for the actual production will be stored here. Some finished goods are scattered around here, but ultimately all of this is to feed our production teams. Right. 
and that and that's just this building. That's too. just this building. So, and when it comes to finished parts, you guys actually have a totally separate. So building. Now we have a completely separate one that's about the same size as this building for finished product. Wow. All right, so we saw several of the different raw drivers being built and made, so where are we now? This is our home product assembly area where we take the, the enclosures that we make here as well as the drivers that we make here and kind of merge it all together in a purpose-built room. So it's kind of neat. When the product first comes in, you'll see we have these little carts with a work order, and we'll stage the electronics as well as the drivers and normally the enclosures underneath, but in this case, we've already started. You'll notice that everything's on a, like a pneumatic lift that brings it up to a comfortable area for the, the operator to work on it. He's got all his machinery all laid out, uh, templates and everything. So that's to stage the amplifier so it doesn't get banged up or anything. Some of the little subtle things that uh, go unnoticed, you know. All the tools overhead, there's torque settings for all the screw guns and everything to make sure everything's perfect. They check that throughout the day, make sure it's 100%. Um, you'll also notice that each one of the workstations is a purple bottle. The purple bottle is a polish. Right? Oh, so the first okay. thing you do is you check the enclosure and you polish the enclosure. No sense building it if there's a blemish on the enclosure. So that's the first thing we do. Second thing we do is do that again. <laughs> it's that important to us because you know, the first impression that a customer gets when they look at the product is the fit and finish of it. And if there's any blemishes on it, that's a negative. Yeah. Right? At least we see it that way. Uh, Curtis worked with me on that. <laughs> we had some trouble there, didn't we? <laughs> and, and by the way, bringing up Curtis, so Curtis has been here for 16 and a half years, yes. right? Yes, he yeah. has. Yep. So so that's, he's, that's definitely a trend we've been seeing a lot throughout of long, the facility. A lot yeah. of long time employees. He's unique, but not in that way. <laughs> well, I'm the, I'm the, um, Last original guy that started in home product. Home product was built in what 2005, I believe. Something like that, yeah. So it was a year before my time. So when I came, it was a group of guys that I was here. So I'm the original one now. Nice, yeah. awesome, awesome. Always greets me. He's always got my props all ready for me, yeah. right? <laughs> all right, cool. <laughs> So we have several different workstations. Uh, these two here focus on our Fathom products. Okay. Um, over here, you see us, uh, we have a Gotham stage ready for some assembly work to be done. You'll notice this one has a ramp. You're not lifting this one, right? <laughs> so even as it sits right here, it's probably about 300 pounds of raw fiberglass. You'll notice there's a, a metal bracket that's bolted in. That's actually for the power supply transformer, the toroid that's used to take uh, wall energy and transform it into amplifier energy so the amplifier can produce the power for the for the Gotham. Okay. This is like a lazy Susan so it spins around and again you'll see all the the special tools and everything all staged ready for the work and Yeah, I love the shadow board. Yeah, you got to have it, right? Yep. So, yeah. Yeah, I learned a lot, you know, Curtis I'm in, I'm in training, of course, right? So I know how to train, but I don't know how to build products. So I came back and spent the day with Curtis, and he was teaching me what went into the Gotham. Because it's not an insignificantly priced product, right. right? So I wanted to learn more about what went into it to justify that when I talked to people. And seeing some of the detail that went into it was just very eye-opening to me. Yeah. In fact, at, at the end of the process that we'll see in a little bit, uh, the, the, the gloves and the, the cable how you fold the cable and how the tag that's on the cable has to be positioned is incredibly precise. And I couldn't do that. I was going to say, why don't you go back to your little desk, okay? <laughs> Keep me out. That so. is so true. <laughs> so that metal bracket that I mentioned, it's for this thing. So oh, wow. yeah. that's the toroid. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's got some weight to yeah, it. Yeah, no yeah. doubt, right? <laughs> Jeez. Wow. Yeah, yes. it's pretty amazing. <laughs> now, the reason for the bracket is if you had that mounted on a circuit board, uh, circuit board's got no chance, right? So yeah. we need to find a better way. And that's so a good, that like, uh, what, three-eighths inch thick piece of yeah, steel? Yeah, yeah, it's solid. <laughs> and, of course, you can see the thickness of the fiberglass in that. And I don't want to mess around too much with what they got here. But come on. Oh, they got it locked on me. Yeah. Ah, see, it was yeah. tricky for you, yeah. too. It's still locked in. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Wait, remind you, the cabinet is heavy. So. <laughs> <laughs> How much do they weigh when they're complete, do you know, offhand? <laughs> 385 or yeah, something like that. Yeah, wow. It's, some, yeah. Yeah. it's a lot. It takes like four of us to lift the, the final um, unit up. Jeez. Yeah, so Mark, I don't have to oh, tell you about bracket. fiberglass, right? Yeah, you yeah. know that about a quarter inch of fiberglass is roughly three quarters inches of MDF. Yep. Yep. So when you look and you got nearly two inches of fiberglass, <laughs> I don't want to do the math, but it's pretty massive, right? Yeah. And on top of that, we have the, the rib reinforcement for even yeah, more rigidity. All, all so, that bracing inside so and just yep. the natural curve of it adds a yep. ton of strength too. Indeed. So in this area is where we uh, assemble the in-wall subwoofers, both the 8-inch and the 13 and a half inch And we have some of the cabinets right over here. Oh, okay. So the tall skinny one here, this is for the 8-inch, and the shorter one over here, this is for the 13 and a half inch There yeah. are two versions of the 13 and a half inch version. This is just one of them. Yeah, and so this goes between the studs, literally Correct. in the wall. Yeah, of hides in the wall completely. Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. The um, 13 and a half inch one literally suspends in the wall and hangs there. 
Uh, so that's cool. We also have an in-ceiling version of the 8-inch. It's hard to get the 13 in the ceiling. Yeah. So, but we do have the 8-inch that fits in the ceiling. And one thing that's kind of neat is due to the way we manufacture the enclosures, we want to make sure that the, the enclosure itself doesn't make any noises. I know this sounds funny because the enclosure shouldn't make any noises, but there's so much bracing that we put inside of those enclosures, we need to check to make sure there is no vibration. So what we'll do is we'll take a driver, put it in the enclosure, and hang the enclosure here, just like it would in the wall. Okay. And it's connected to an amplifier and a tone generator, and we use a stethoscope <laughs> to listen to the enclosure to make sure there are no vibrations coming from any of the bonds that are made inside the enclosure. Because once it's in a wall, yeah, it ain't right. coming out. Yeah, right. uh, not without a lot of people getting really upset. So we'll actually listen to it in this room and make sure that the box itself is not making any unwanted noises. Awesome. Now, I'm glad you had that on video because if I told you that, no one would believe you. But here it is. This is where we do all of that. So. Once everything's all put together, we gotta verify that things are working. And one of the first things we have to do is make sure it's safe for people to plug in. If you buy like a clock radio or a lamp or something, it's got the little cable that says it's CE approved and it's okay to plug in. We do that testing here and we do that both for uh, US voltages as well as international voltages. Essentially what we do is we plug it in, put a whole bunch of current through the circuit to make sure everything's gonna be okay for you. And once it gets that, we can approve that for, uh, for proper sale. Okay. And then from there, um, there's another test that we do here where the products have an auto on and auto off feature. So we have to test that. And that's usually when Curtis has some fun. He'll crank up some bass music, turns the subwoofer on, the bass starts playing. He leaves it play for a little bit, then he turns it off and he watches to see when it turns off. And we use a timer to make sure that the parameters are all correct every time. So okay. When it passes that, it goes around the corner where we do the final performance testing. Ooh. This is all circuit testing. And the performance testing is, yes, ooh, it's exactly <laughs> what you're thinking. So here, I'll show you that next. Um, what we have here is a fixture that holds the microphone and puts it in close proximity to the driver. And the switches and dials, everything on the product is going to be tested and it's run through a computer system, basically error bars. It can't exceed or go below the thresholds that we set in the system. So one by one, Curtis or one of the other team members will go through and change each one of these settings to check every bit of the performance of the driver, including the, the, the digital automatic room optimization or DARO circuit that we have mm -hmm. in the product. Um, he'll erase that because this is not a typical room. So he'll test to make sure it's working, then erase it, and then it's ready for shipping out. But there's something that we include with every one that I wanted to share with you. The optimization circuit requires a microphone, so there's a microphone that's in this package here, and then the white gloves, literally white gloves that come with it. The white gloves and the reason right. for it is the finish is so special. We don't want the oils from the the, the you know the the unpackager, whether that's the customer or the shop, to touch that and mar that surface. So we'll provide a pair of gloves. For Gotham products, it's two pairs of gloves because no one's lifting that. Yeah. Not even a big man like Curtis, right? <laughs> One thing that I learned is um, when we go out and show packaging, the detail that we put into the actual finish of the product is so special. Um, there's A surfaces, B surfaces, and C surfaces. A surface is anything that calls your eye to it. So all of this would be an A surface. A B surface might be something that you're not likely to see. C surface is something that an end user will never see. So behind some of the panels that you would never see unless you started dismantling the product, that would be a C surface. In other words, it just needs to be covered decently with paint. Everything else is gonna be a pretty high level. Curtis shared with me the bottom of these enclosures is an A surface. It is an A surface. It's the first surface you see. Ah, so when you that. open the package, you're looking at the bottom of the product. You'll never see it again after that because you can't lift half these things. <laughs> but when you first look at that product, we want the only thing you to see back is your shining face. That's it. Any blemishes on that sets a, uh, an impression in the customer's mind. And you know, that to us is real special. And you know, I like sharing that because, yes, the product is wonderful. It performs really well. But that first impression, you, know, you spend quite a bit of money for a JL Audio yeah. product. And especially on the level of a home audio product, that, that first impression has got to be a positive one down to the white gloves. Thank you, Curtis. Love it. I, I like to, again, I mean, everywhere we've been so far, we've been seeing, I'm sure you guys made this fixture okay, as well that holds a... <laughs> in and it holds the microphone there in place. Yeah, this is a new iteration. We used to have it look more like Swiss cheese. And it yeah. wasn't... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so packaging. Now, normally people don't get real excited about packaging, but there's some cool things that I wanted to share with you. I mean, it's a heavy product, right? It is so a heavy it's, product. It so a special packaging solution, I'm sure. It does, and um, obviously we have several different products, but all of them have a similar type of packaging. So here is the packaging, and if you look in here, let me pull this panel down. There's wood at the bottom with bolts that go through the bottom to ah. attach. I call them donuts because they kind of look like donuts. Yeah. <laughs> we have two flavors of donuts. We have the green donuts and we have purple donuts. And it's uh, basically they're high impact absorbing and low friction. 
So when it's being transported, it'll absorb a lot of the shake, rattle, and roll that'll happen on a truck. And then when it's on location at a customer's home, it's low friction, so you can shimmy the box into place. Now the bottom of the box is pointing up when you get it. So when the box shows up and you open it, you'll be looking at the bottom, Yeah. right? So that you take it and dump it out, you tip it over, and then lift it back up, and then it's, and right it's on up. its feet, right? Yep. So you'll never see the bottom again, but obviously we want that first impression to be special, so. Well, that, and that, that, sounds, that sounds silly, but when you have such a huge enclosure, that is helpful, the fact that you're tipping it over yes. and it's in its final mm -hmm. position. It's not like you have to lift it out of right. the box and yeah. shimmy over. And of course, you know, the manly men try to do that and they <laughs> fail miserably because it's too heavy, right? Yeah. What are these? Uh, this the is side? on the other side, okay. yeah. So the, yeah. the donut makes up. Oh, it has a tea nut. Yep. A tea nut inside mm -hmm. there. There you go. Cool. Neat stuff, though. I and like then it. from here, right onto the truck, brought over to finished goods, and out it goes. Awesome. All right, so I'm here with Shane. Shane, remind me your, your position here. I am the service manager at Jay Lottigan. For our service department, we triage everything from our direct to our consumers. The consumers can contact us directly. Uh, down to our dealer uh, base. So basically, they'll contact us, you know, let us know what's going on. We're going to find out basically what their issues are with the product. Uh, we're going to set up uh, return authorizations for them so they can send the product into them. We'll bring it in, we'll inspect the product, we'll have the product tested to see what the issues could be to find out if it's uh, something that can be repaired on site. Um, or if we're going to go ahead and replace it with a newer product so that we want to keep the process as smooth as possible for them so we can have them the least amount of time without their products so right, we can right. get them back. And that's, that's one thing I've always heard about JL Audio is, you know, the great customer service. If there is an issue, I mean, obviously you guys support it. So if something does come in and you need to fix it, do you actually repair it in here or is it? Uh, we have uh, our two locations. So this is our main hub. We do mostly speakers here. Okay. Um, so most of our speakers are just replaced with newer versions. Okay. Um, our electronics, we do have a lot of models that can be repaired on site, which is at our Phoenix facility. Okay. So they'll you know, inspect it and test it and figure out what is wrong. And a lot of them they can repair. Um, if not, and they can't replicate the symptoms, then we'll end up replacing it with a, a new model. Okay. So that way we can take care of them. Okay. So like behind us right now, so these guys are, I'm, I'm assuming, receiving product Yes, so they in. receive the product in. Uh, we take pictures, we unpack it, we inspect it, and then we break the speaker down. Uh, down to make sure that you know exactly what the cause of the issue was mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll process it out through the system and then that gets sent to our support team and then our support team will take care of the final steps to make sure we process and get replacement product out or if it was repaired in any way uh, back out to the customer so awesome. we can get it taken care of cool awesome well thanks for showing us thank around. you appreciate, appreciate you so, so Steve was just saying at one point everything ended at, here. Right, this was the end of the building. This was the end of the building, but with the constant growth of JL Audio, we're now heading on. But here. wait, there's more. There's more. <laughs> All right, so I'm here with Russ, and Russ is the manager of the machine shop here at JL Audio. So we were already talking a little bit, and I was like, man, we got to get you mic'd up and, and get this on the record, because there's some cool stuff that goes down in your department here. Oh, so yeah. first of all, uh, it seems to me like there's three major things that you guys kind of do here. Like one is you create a lot of the fixtures and everything that's being used. All of them. Yes. All of them. For yeah. production. Yep. And yeah. then you also actually machine parts that come in as raw goods and you're doing a machining we, operation on them. We uh, finish machine them to our specs. Yep. It's usually better than what we can get outsourcing them, yes. Awesome. Yeah. And then also do a ton of prototyping work. Yes, a so, lot of so, prototyping. Yeah, so you were saying all the all the newest products always come through here essentially first because yep. you're prototyping them and, and working with the engineers on all the design of yep. everything. And Oh yeah. So obviously there's a ton of different machines around us. How, how many machines are, are in here roughly? We have uh, four five axis, fully five axis capabilities. We have mill turns, lays, Regular mills, we can pretty much cut anything they can need do it to all. get done. Yes, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. They treat us really well here with the budget. <laughs> yeah. We have to. We got to be able to make whatever they want to test. Yeah, for fast, sure. Usually, yeah. for sure. And that, that's the other big advantage, right? Like if there's an idea on the prototyping side of thing, they can have you guys do it so quickly yes. as opposed to outsourcing it or yeah. doing it. And different. we can make changes and repairs fairly quickly to you know, try something new the next day or the same day, which helps a lot. Yeah. When you're outsourcing, you're usually waiting a week, two weeks, or a month. Nowadays, you don't know when you're going to get something done. 
and you don't know how accurate it's going to be. So right, yeah, it's a big yeah. advantage for sure. Yeah. So and then on the production side, so you guys take the the baskets and you do a machining operation on we, those. Yeah, we take the basket, and we machine everything to uh, Lucio specs to the, the ID and the mounting heights of all the motors and uh, the surround, and it, it, it just works out much better, comes out as a much better product than it would be normally. Right, uh, for sure. You're mounting it to a cast piece. And then not only that, you guys also make the, the feet that are used in the Gotham? We make the feet, yep. um, right to spec. We make all our own bushing kits for all the products. Um, there's just hundreds of parts we make now. We make a, a lot of stuff here. Yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have the list in front of me, but <laughs> it's a we're lot. always working on SKU numbers nowadays versus just prototyping like it was originally. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Quite the shop. Oh, yeah. Appreciate nice, it. Thank nice you. Nice meeting you. Nice Thank you. you. All right. So I'm here with Lewis from the fiber. You're, you're the manager, right? Of this, yeah. This manager of the whole enclosure area, fiberglass and installation side. Right behind us right now is the fiberglass department. So this is where stealth box? Stealth boxes uh, for the marine area and also for the, for the car audio industry. Yeah. We build them over here. So, st so stealth box on the car audio side and then the marine product as well. So exactly. we haven't really gone in there yet, so I haven't got the full lay of the land, but give me an idea of what we're going to see. So we're going to see a team of about uh, 60 people, two, two different chefs. We have uh, more than 200 SKUs wow. between cell boxes, marine speakers, and, and so on. We manufacture around 300 units a week. Wow. So process-wise, I'm guessing you start with a, like a mold? Or? Yeah, we, we have a group of molds every week, different, week, uh, different molds based on our forecast, our sales, and we put them on the line. The first that we do, we apply the Robicor, which is the carbon glass itself. Uh, we inject the resin, which is a compound that put everything together. Yep. Uh, we inject them in half, and then we, we call them shells. So then we put it together on the bonding process, and then we go to the sanding and finish. So we make sure that all the details comes on, all the different angles pop up, so it will fit perfectly on, on the car, on, on the boat. Right, right. After they're made, do you guys wrap them and with the upholstery materials over here, or is that no, a separate it's, area? That's uh, further in the process. Okay. So yeah, we do have two different sides. We have the carpeting area, and we also have the painting side. So we have the two different type of products. Uh, well, the third one, which is carpet and paint. So okay. awesome. depending on the case. Awesome. We ended up spending a ton of time together going through the full process here, including taking a look at the detail work that goes into these enclosures, and for some of the more complicated enclosures, seeing the rest of the production line. Now we actually spent so much time looking at everything, I think it probably warrants having its own separate video, so if you guys would like to see this area in more detail, let us know. And, and this is exciting too, the Gotham that's actually being painted behind us right now is... Is it number 1000 at this point? Uh, number 1,000. Yes. Crazy. So he has a number inside, so we'll show you later. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to get that number for sure. So I am here with Harry. How you doing, sir? Good. Tell us tell us where we're at right now. We're in the JL Audio, what we call the Woodshop CMC department. This is where we make all the wood enclosures, all the in-wall enclosures, and the and the other parts uh, that we built, we use for W6 and W7 uh, speakers, which are the uh, some of, some of the panels and some of the rings we use. To, to oh, even for the packaging, packaging and stuff. Yeah, too. for the packaging, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. We have 30 different closure models that we build, okay. and uh, we have uh, uh, f uh, five different uh, in-wall closures that we build. Okay. Right? Uh, on a roughly on a weekly basis, we're building about 700 enclosures, and, and uh, around between 80 to uh, 90 uh, in-wall uh, wow. uh, a, a, a so, week. So, right? step, so 700 enclosures a week? Yes. Okay, yeah, and 80, 80 to 90 in-wall enclosures on top of that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. so obviously there's some CNC machinery back here. Right. Uh, how many machines do you have? Uh, we have three machines. Okay. Uh, and uh, they're all Como CNC machines from the Como, Como, Como company. Uh, we've had a few of them we've had for uh, about uh, 15 years or 20 years, and we have a new one that's about uh, 12 years old. Okay. Right. How, how big is the capacity on each one? Uh, they're all they're all they all fit. Uh, uh, actually, two of them fit five by eight. And okay. one, one fits five by ten. Wow. Uh, wood. So they're big machines. Uh, yeah, we do. We do have five different uh, types of wood we use. 
uh, we use a, a three eighths, a half inch, five eighths, uh, three quarters, and, and one inch all the enclosures. Okay. And we use a, a nine millimeter birch uh, for the in-wall enclosure. Okay. okay. So, so all the sizes you listed, that's MDF. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. So, so obviously we would start with a raw piece of material, Correct. and then it would go through the como and be cut. Right. What, what other uh, processes go on after that? Once we cut it, we have a certain amount of, of stack of anything between 80 to 120 on a pallet. Okay. okay. Once we once we finish that pallet, we then bring it over to the carpet uh, assembly area where we where we spray glue and uh, uh, do the wrap set. Uh, yeah. Once, what, what's what's unique about the enclosures is they're they're actually like. I don't, I don't know what you would call that, but you cut like a groove almost. A dado. A dado. It, yeah, it's called a dado, yes. Okay. Yes. For, for each of the corners where they come uh, together? So, so basically you have a dado, so you have an outside wrap, yep. and then you have a dado with the inside wrap, and that, that's where the inside wrap uh, 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 inserts into it to fold it over to make one, one enclosure. Yeah. Okay. It's really cool. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll show some of the guys on screen right now so they have an idea, but it, it's right. neat how those enclosures come together. So, so after all the machining and cutting is done, it comes over here where final assembly is done along with upholstery? Uh, we use carpet, yep. simply carpet. Uh, we use two different types of carpet. We use a, we use a gray, gray carpet and a black carpet to make a, a model. And most of them, we have, like I said, we have 30 models. I think there's 25 models that, that actually get embroidery and five models that have it like a deco panel or insert that goes on the box. Right. And they'll, but they all say JL Audio on them. This is another area that there was just so much to see that I got enough content to make a full other video going into more detail. So if you'd like to see that, let us know. All right, so I'm here with Mike in the VS R&D area, and that stands for? Vehicle Systems Research and Development. So this is essentially where the stealth box kind of starts, if you will, right? That's right. Yeah, any kind of application for any of our products. So stealth box is vehicle specific enclosures. Yep. Uh, they start here. So okay. we'll bring the vehicles in, uh, you know, a specific target list of vehicles. We'll bring those in and uh, immediately kick off the prototype. So, okay. Um, yeah, what does that process look like, I guess, from start to finish? We, we target a specific list of vehicles, um, usually based on the customer that's going to be buying that vehicle, what kind of audience that is. Um, if it's somebody that's willing to modify the vehicle, like a Jeep customer or right. F-150 or something like that. So we'll have that target list. We'll bring those vehicles in, put a test box in. Uh, test box is usually one of our wooden enclosures. The orientation and the vehicle itself is gonna make a big difference. So right. you're gonna have a cabin gain that's different on a hatchback versus a truck versus whatever, right? So uh, we put a test box in, we'll put it in a few different orientations, uh, determine what's gonna work best. And sometimes that's dictated by the available space. We'll choose the right woofer for yep. the application and then we'll reverse engineer that location. Gotcha. And that's done by with a scan tool. So we need to capture that geometry of the vehicle. So okay. we'll use a 3D scanner. So it's a, it's a laser scanner. Uh, bring that into CAD as an STL file and then best fit some surfaces to get our build envelope. Okay. And that'll determine how much airspace we have to work with, which sometimes will dictate the woofer choice, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a really tiny space like uh, the new Tesla Model Y, for example, we have to go with a specific woofer because we just don't have the volume. Right. Um, and luckily, that's what JL Audio often <laughs> excels at is subwoofers that work in a very small amount of volume. Exactly. Yeah, we do that. We bring in, the, we have that envelope, that, that space, and then fit the woofer into whatever plane that's going to fit in and, yeah. and work well in the vehicle, and then create a, a CAD model of the enclosure. Um, from there, once we're satisfied with the model, so we, we're confident in the airspace, we're confident in the orientation, uh, how it's going to perform, we then cut a plug. Okay. And that is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, yeah. that is MDF. Okay. So it's usually sliced MDF, it's like two inch thick, one inch thick. We'll piece those together, glue them up, and have a, have a plug. Just Almost a, like a stack. Of it's the, a stack, but it's yeah. not hollow. It's just a solid oh. model of the outside. The outside. Okay. The outside surfaces. And then we test fit in the car make okay. sure there was no issues with fitment or anything like that. After we build a mold, then we lay up a fiberglass part in that, bond it together, test fit the actual part, and then we're, and then we're once pretty you, much done. Right, once you prove that out, then you're able to start going into production. That's right. Yeah. So you were talking a little bit about when you're doing the initial testing and you know putting the subwoofer in, in just an enclosure and kind of making sure that you have a good area to work with. Do you kind of match like a, a target curve on like a vehicle that you know works well? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much exactly what we do. So we 
we have captured frequency response uh, acoustically from, the, say, the driver's seat or wherever of a vehicle that we've done in the past, and we're really satisfied with the performance. Okay. And then when we measure these new vehicles, we'll compare that response to the one we're happy with and see if if it's even a viable option, right? Uh, right. Is it going to work for us? How do we expect it to perform? Do we need to choose a different woofer? Yeah. Stuff like that. So there's a lot of scientific method, really, that kind of goes into that process of making sure that it's the right choice for the vehicle, the right subwoofer, the right amount of airspace. And of course, I'm sure you're sure you're taking into account the, the fact that, you know, you want everything to be usable within the vehicle still, too. You don't want to uh, take up too much cargo area or anything exactly. like that. Yeah, that's it's a stealth of, box. It's so a it's stealth box. It yeah. was for. So if we want to take up as much usable space as we can, still get the performance yeah. that we're after. Awesome. So Gary was just saying he's been here how long? About 35 years. 35 ago. years. Since and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and also a, a big part, of, a big contributor of the team of making this, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone back at home got to see that when we saw it at the Master Tech Expo. So awesome build. I'm back in my shop now and. Wow, what an experience getting to see firsthand all of the different aspects of how a JL audio product comes to life. The quality and passion that everyone at JL puts into making incredible sounding audio is very clear, but I think what stood out to me most is how much JL audio cares about its people. You probably noticed throughout the tour that there were many people that have been with JL for more than 10 years, many over 20 and even 30. I personally have a background in engineering and manufacturing, so I will say that to see a company that has such a high retention of its employees is an awesome and very rare thing to see. It's super cool to learn all about these people that are behind making these items. Now you may have also noticed that most of our tour was focused on making speakers, subwoofers, and the enclosures, and not so much the electronics, and that's because the electronic side of production for JL Audio is at a different location out in Arizona. There may be an opportunity for us to go out there and check out that location as well. So if you'd like to see that, let us know. A big thanks to JL Audio for bringing us out to visit. I'm definitely looking forward to rocking more of the gear in the future here on the channel. And thank you guys for tuning in and watching.